Hello, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today on the second of this series of suicide prevention webinars. It's it's um, it's great to have you with us. Um, today we're going to be talking about risk assessment, um, specifically risk assessment um, in relation to suicide. Um, we talk about this a lot and it's something that it's important that we do talk about a lot and um, hopefully today we'll continue the ongoing discussion that that needs to take place with regard to how we can um, you know reflect on our practice and do our best for those uh, for whom we care. Now as with any um, of these webinars um, we do appreciate that we're talking about a difficult issue and some people will have um, experienced or been exposed to uh, suicide or, or attempted suicide or self-harm in their professional lives and possibly in their personal lives. In the chat, Emily has put in um, details about the Support After Suicide organisation and also details of You Matter, which is um, our uh, staff wellbeing hub uh, and you can uh, approach them at, at any time if you require uh, support, not necessarily specific to the topic we're talking about today, but generally. Now, it's a real privilege today to welcome um, the co-authors of a paper we recently published around risk assessment, around, specifically around therapeutic uh, risk assessment and management and form formulation and management. Um, so we have Professor Keith Horton from the Centre for Suicide Research, which many of you know, and we, we hear from him. We're fortunate to hear from him frequently. In addition, we have two of the other three co-authors, uh, Alexandra Pittman, who is a consultant psychiatrist and a clinical academic uh, linked to um, University UCL. I don't, can't even remember what that stands for, <laughs> but it's a university in London. <laughs> um, and she specialises in research around suicide and self-harm. And we're also um, joined by Steve Gilbert, who uh, again is an author on the paper. Steve has um, extensive experience of um, mental illness, including periods of depression and suicide attempts and hospitalisation. He has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and complex PTSD, the result of um, psychological abuse he experienced in his early years through to adulthood. Um, so Steve was um, generous with his experience in helping to guide us in the development of the Lancet paper. We will put a copy of that with the webinar on the intranet. Steve um, was appointed as vice chair for the Mental Health Act Review. He supported the chair in making recommendations to government, chairing the Service User and Carer Group and co-chairing the Black African Caribbean Working Group. Um, he's also advised the National Suicide Prevention Alliance on the meaningful involvement of suicide attempt survivors. Um, and through his consultancy, he now supports organisations implementing ambitious anti-racism programmes. So we're really delighted, Steve, to welcome you joining us today. Um, so you will hear from Keith, followed by Alexandra, followed by Steve, and then there will be time for question and answers. So please um, put your Q&As in the, in the Q&A chat and we will come back to them after everybody's presented and hopefully have um, an interesting and constructive discussion. Thanks very much. Without further ado, I will hand over to Keith. Um, thanks very much, Karen. Um, and uh, I guess many of you will have been watching the uh, very moving ceremony of uh, the Queen's body being transferred from Buckingham Palace to uh, Westminster Hall this afternoon. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us um, after that uh, occasion. So if I can have the first slide, please. As Karen um, said, um, a group of us have been uh, working on writing an article about uh, um, suicide risk assessment. Sorry, could I have the first slide, please? Victoria there. All right. Thanks very much. Um, uh, we've been thinking about uh, uh, the problem of suicide risk assessment um, in mental health practice, which is obviously a major concern for all clinicians um, and uh, yet is associated with uh, considerable problems. 
And we ended up writing this article, um, Assessment of Suicide Risk in Mental Health Practice, Shifting from Prediction to Therapeutic Assessment, Formulation and Risk Management. Um, uh, I guess it took us a year or so to do so, but it was published about uh, five weeks ago in uh, Lancet Psychiatry. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is the the actual uh, article, and as Karen said, it will be made available on the uh, intranet, so you don't need to send me emails to have copies of it. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, um, in England, uh, we know from the confidential inquiry, the National Confidential Inquiry, that of people who die by suicide, which is approximately 5,000 per year, some uh, 25 to 30 percent have been in current contact with uh, psychiatric services uh, at the time of their death or in the year before their death. And uh, therefore it's very logical that in clinical practice one should try to predict those patients most at risk. But this is where the major problem is. Suicide risk prediction largely does not work. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the evidence for this? Uh, next slide, please. Now, in the uh, National and Confidential Inquiry report of 2021 shown here, uh, there was data published on clinicians retrospective assessment of um, patients risk uh, at their last clinical contact prior to dying by suicide. Next slide, please. And um, this was over uh, 11 years, so it was a, included a very large number of patients. And um, the, all these patients had died by suicide, yet the clinicians estimated immediate risk at the last service contact prior to suicide was low or absent in 85%. So nearly all were thought to have been at low or nil risk of uh, suicide, and yet they died by suicide within a relatively short, short while. And even when clinicians were asked about the, their estimated long ter longer term risk for the, each of these patients, uh, they thought it had been low or absent in nearly 60 to 60%. Next slide, please. Uh, in a much smaller study from the USA, this is 132 patients uh, in mental health care who die within 30 days of a clinical evaluation. Uh, three quarters of them had denied suicidal intent when they were last asked. And, and yet half of these died within two days of being asked about their suicidal intent, died by suicide that is. Next slide please. And there's many other studies showing that the uh, majority of people who die by suicide, the majority of mental health patients who die by suicide, have denied suicidal intention when last asked before their deaths. Uh, these are some older studies and there's uh, lots more, more recent ones that show similar findings. Next slide, please. So why might this be? Why would people who uh, go on to die by suicide shortly afterwards uh, deny that they were feeling suicidal, that they had suicidal intention at the time of a clinical assessment. Well, one possibility is that they feared being judged negatively uh, by clinicians and, and therefore hid their suicidal intention. Another might be that they didn't fully understand the question. It might not have been put clearly. Uh, another possibility is that they were asked in a manner which encouraged a negative response, such as uh, you're not feeling suicidal, are you? Or uh, you're not thinking of doing something silly, for example. Um, uh, or they may have feared that if they'd answered positively, then uh, their care would have been increased in intensity and possibly they might have been sectioned or whatever. Um, or, of course, they may have been wanting to hide the fact they were suicidal and be present, prevented from uh, engaging in a suicidal act. But probably the most likely reason in the vast majority is they weren't actually suicidal at the time. Next slide. Uh, 
So if we look at the um, the issue of uh, suicidal ideation, uh, we know that suicidal thoughts are often very brief, they fluctuate uh, over time. Uh, and as an illustration of the uh, brevity of this, there was a study by uh, Dyson Hammer and colleagues who um, interviewed patients who had attempted suicide and nearly half of them reported having thought about the act for 10 minutes or less beforehand. And then in a study um, by Kleiman and colleagues uh, where they did ecological momentary assessments, in other words, they uh, repeatedly uh, got measures, uh, got patients to re record measures during the daytime. Um, and these were patients who'd attempted suicide in the previous year or in men or were mental health inpatients uh, because of suicidal ideation. They found that their suicidal ideation varied dramatically over the course of most days, as did measures of hopelessness, uh, sense of burden, being a burden, and uh, so a reported loneliness. Next slide, please. Now, one of the, the issue here is that in clinical practice, if no suicidal ideation is expressed by a patient at assessment, uh, the, the risk assessment may end. No suicidal ideation, and then therefore their risk may be formulated as none or low. Um, and as a result of this, their clinical priority may also be regarded as low and there, uh, any sort of clinical intervention uh, may well be delayed. Next slide, please. What about use of risk scales? How well do they work? Next slide, please. I mean, there have been many uh, studies looking at suicide risk prediction scales or risk prediction tools. Uh, some of them uh, looking at risk prediction in general, uh, for suicide, some of them looking in specific groups of patients who may regarded, be regarded at particularly high risk, such as people who'd self-harmed. Next slide, please. And yet, uh, the uh, outcome of these tools is extremely poor. So the positive predictive value is about 5%, which means that they're wrong 95% of the time in terms of the prediction they provide. So while um, uh, suicides are somewhat more frequent in a group of patients who are measured as being at high risk, um, the difference uh, in risk between them and uh, those in other risk groups are not great. And importantly, most suicides include, occur in the much larger group of patients who are identified as at low or moderate risk. And this is what we call the prevention uh, paradox. Next slide, please. And um, as a result of this evidence, in the um, NICE self-harm harm guidance uh, published in 2011, and uh, the, of which there's been an update just a, a week or so ago, um, the uh, recommendation was do not use risk assessment tools and scales to predict future suicide or repetition of self-harm. So this is specifically in self-harm patients. And do not use risk assessment tools and scales to determine who should be offered treatment who, or who should be discharged. Uh, there has been an acknowledgement that uh, risk assessment tools can provide a structure within an assessment and as such may have some use, but in terms of actual prediction, uh, they really don't work. Next slide, please. Why, why the, then are we so obsessed with risk prediction, suicide risk prediction? Well, one thing is, of course, that hospital organisations are extremely keen on it. Trusts are, are uh, very keen that uh, risk uh, prediction uh, measures are completed. Um, one sometimes wonders if that's more for the pr protection of the trust uh, rather than the patient, um, given what I've told you about their poor performance. Regulatory agencies may be uh, drivers of um, uh, 
of uh, the use of risk scales. So organizations that oversee trusts um, or have other regulatory uh, responsibilities. Coroners and uh, similar agencies may expect a risk assessment to have been completed on patients who've died by suicide. So there's a sort of paradox there that uh, the coroner may ask, well, was the risk assessment completed uh, and yet the patient died? Um, and of course, clinicians may themselves uh, be keen to use such measures, partly, I guess, to maintain some sort of sense of control, even though the performance of these measures is pretty useless. Next slide, please. So what are the alternatives to uh, risk prediction? What is a, a, another way forward? Well, the first one is to obviously recognize that risk prediction is a fallacy. Um, uh, if you think about yourself, can you predict exactly what you're going to be doing in a week's time? Uh, I certainly can't. Um, and, and the same applies to prediction of suicide risk. But I think it's useful to think about a sort of population approach to prevention of suicidal behaviour. Next slide, please. And an analogy here is with uh, blood pressure. So this slide is showing um, the effect of adopting a population approach to shifting blood pressure. In other words, reducing blood pressure in the population by a small amount, um, just a couple of, uh, uh, between two and five um, millimeters uh, head per uh, of blood pressure. And you bet yet you can see bottom right, the impact this can have in reduction of deaths. Uh, from, very, from a range of causes. And, and we should be thinking in the same way about suicide, uh, suicide prevention in, in mental health patients. So I'm going to hand over now to Alexandra, who will tell you a little more about the approach we've espoused. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Keith. So I'm going to focus now on, on the process of dynamic risk formulation. Um, next two slides, please. And this is an approach which allows you to really use the time liberated by no longer being preoccupied by, you know, categorizing people into high, medium, low risk to really take the time to develop um, a therapeutic alliance with your patient and to really find out about the things that matter to them. And the figure that we used in our article um, which we um, adapted from a, a figure presented by some other authors. We, we presented this figure because we found it a useful way to organise the detailed information that you collect in a, in a um, therapeutic risk, um, therapeutic assessment. And the, these, th this um, structure presents things that they look like suicide risk factors, but we really mean them to, to um, stand for factors that can cause distress in any patient presenting um, for mental health care. And so we've organised them into predisposing factors, um, strengths, which sometimes we think of as protective factors, but also importantly, modifiable factors. And these are the kind of things that we really focus on in our care plan and thinking what we can change for the patient and instill hope in them that things can change. And we're also gaining a sense of what might happen to them in the future. And that's why this is a really dynamic assessment because we're anticipating where things might break down for them in the future. So for example, we might identify under strengths and protective factors that somebody has really good social support from a partner. But in the future, it may be that that relationship could break down because the relationship is, is sometimes a little difficult. So we need to anticipate that if it does break down or if that person is in poor health and might pass away in the future, that things might change. And this is something which changes over time. So every time this patient is assessed by you or by, by other clinicians, um, different factors might have different resonance at different points. And if any of the factors in the top right become particularly problematic, for example, under the under the um, the, the, the physical health category, you might have somebody who develops acute pain and that means that they are in severe distress and feeling extremely suicidal. Um, 
then this could be a warning sign that they could be at risk. But the point of the approach we describe in the article is that we are thinking about these factors for every single patient attempting to reduce their distress and try and address modifiable factors to, to reduce the distress and in brackets risk of everybody who we assess. Next slide, please. And the next one, please. So the, the, the time that's spent really getting to, to know the patient, to understand all these factors that matter to them um, and organising into this framework can help us see how a patient might typically respond um, to life stresses and how that might um, become very distressing for them and how that might precipitate a suicidal crisis. So, for example, they may be in a situation where they're being um, bullied at work or they're under a lot of pressure and they notice that they're becoming more stressed, their sleep is impaired and they're becoming more irritable and low in mood. They're starting to row with people around them who would normally constitute their social support, slightly alienating people around them. You can see how these dynamic factors are changing all the time. They're starting to increase alcohol, which might also mean that their antidepressants are less effective um, and they're starting to notice negative thoughts and they become really quite suicidal. So this is a really helpful way to think about where you might address modifiable um, risk factors and where you might start to identify uh, things breaking down early on and intervene at an earlier stage. And next slide, please. So the next um, section is to think about, next slide, please, um, addressing um, patients needs and thinking about interventions that are going to make an immediate difference. And I think one of the things that patients who present in suicidal crisis sometimes feel is that um, nothing really happens as a result of attending um, a crisis service. And that's regardless of whether they are feeling suicidal at the time or not. And a way to really reinforce that therapeutic alliance is to identify things that can make an immediate difference to them. So if somebody is in pain, you can um, ask somebody to review their pain, perhaps refer them to a pain clinic, make sure that their um, pain medications are optimised. You might refer them to local alcohol services. You might talk them through interventions that they can use to address their sleep. So these are all things you can discuss in the moment that they can, ena they can enact immediately to shift something in um, the factors that cause them to present. And at the same time, think about how these can be reinforced with longer term interventions and thinking about what's available locally in the trust but also in the community to think about a range of evidence-based interventions that you could refer them for or if you ask someone else to do it to make sure that happens um, and to ensure that there is that continuity of care because sometimes people describe it very frustrating meeting someone in a crisis situation and then the plans that are made are not followed up by colleagues within the same organization. Next slide please. So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, safety planning. Next slide, please. And this is something that we mentioned in our article because it's something that you can do in the moment with the patient. And because you've spent all that time really thinking about um, the very individual circumstances that they present in, you can construct with them a really detailed safety plan, which isn't a generic you know, call a helpline if you feel suicidal. It's a really thoughtful safety plan tailored to their interests, their social network and the kind of things that tend to work for them. So this is a very structured stepped approach in which the, the first stage is to identify, you know, what are the kind of things that tend to precipitate, cri precipitate crises? What are the things that you notice are starting to go wrong? So relating that to the example in the previous slide, somebody might be feeling very stressed at work, they're becoming more irritable, they're rowing with people around them, they're starting to drink more. So these are the kind of things that you might put into the safety plan or they might write into their own safety plan that's been printed out for them so they can take this away with them. The next two stages, steps three, two and three, are very much focused on distracting somebody so that they can really tide themselves over through the crisis. And these involve thinking about things that, that distract them. Some people like um, watching box sets or they like going out for a walk, but you have to really think about um, things that are going to be feasible. So if they tend to be in crisis at four o'clock in the morning and they live in an unsafe area, it's just not worth putting something in like going for a walk. And this reinforces the point about tailoring it to their own needs. The third step is the, 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 the first point at which you actually contact a human being. And I think that's really important because this whole safety plan um, 
reinforces the patient's autonomy in using steps one and two to manage the crisis by themselves before enlisting other people. And the other striking thing about step three is it, that it doesn't actually involve telling anybody that you're having a suicidal crisis. It may involve phoning a friend and saying, oh, do you want to go for a walk together just to distract you rather than talk to them? Next slide. Thank you. So it's step four is, is the point at which you actually disclose to people that you are feeling suicidal. And remember that these steps um, are progressed through if the step before isn't working. So if you got to stage three and, and, and the, the crisis is resolved and you don't need to progress to step four. But at step four, you're asking people um, in your social circle who can provide support. So these are people who you've identified in your assessment that they trust and can share their problems with and would be available in times of crisis. And ideally, and this is something to discuss with them, they should be aware that they've been included in that safety plan. And step five, and notice this is the first time that professionals appear in, in the, the safety plan. This is when you might call the mental health team, your GP or any voluntary sector organisations that are appealing to you. So they may be specific services they've used or that are suitable for their demographic. And then the final stage is really making the environment safe. And this is deliberately at the end. Um, it's the idea of removing potential harmful means. And this obviously invokes the idea that restricting access to the means of suicide is the most effective suicide prevention intervention. And finally, in red here, it's so important that this is written down for the patient to take away with them, that you've agreed it between you. It's not something you've just created and given to the patient and something that is a live document so they can edit it every time they feel they need to. Next slide, please. And here's an example of a, of a safety plan that might be suitable for use in Oxford. It's got a few at Oxford Health um, and at the bottom there. But again, it's really important that this is this is tailored to the individual. Next slide, please. And there is evidence that um, safety planning is effective in reducing suicidal ideation. And what's striking here that was is that the number needed to treat and the systematic review of studies evaluating the effectiveness of safety planning interventions, um, the number needed to treat was 16. So that was um, you'd, you'd need to, to deliver a safety plan to 16 people to have somebody um, have a um, show reduction in in suicidal behaviour. So I think that's very encouraging evidence. Next slide, please. Involving relatives um, is sometimes difficult because um, even though this is good practice and it's recommended in guidelines produced by Rethink and the recent NICE guidelines, it's really important to gain the patient's consent. And sometimes patients do say, look, I don't want my relatives to know because I don't want to worry them and I, I don't want them to know how bad things are and I don't want to, that you know, them to, to use this as a weapon against me because things are not going very well at the time, but that it's important to explain to the patient that there are a lot of advantages in this because it helps gain another perspective on their difficulties. It also gives a chance to gather some information on the things that the family might be concerned about, but also it brings the family in um, in a collaborative role and many relatives express frustration at not being involved more in, in a more collaborative way um, in crisis plans. So it gives them an awareness of their role so they're not surprised in a crisis if they're suddenly contacted. And it also reassures people that the person who, who is distressed is getting appropriate support. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, um, next slide, uh, to focus on the therapeutic aspects of, of the relationship, I hope that you can see that there are really clear advantages in taking the time to convey your concern for the patient and your real interest in finding out about them and to use, you know, I suppose advanced methods of, of verbal and non-verbal communication to really convey empathy and the fact that you're very, very interested in identifying things that you can, you can help them with, but also identifying their own strengths and being clear that you're motivated to address their needs, to try and shift something for them. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, Keith has shown very clearly that suicide risk prediction doesn't work and that it's very important that we shift the focus from trying to predict risk in these this kind of golden hour with the patient to a much more therapeutic and dynamic um, formulation of their needs and an individualised risk management plan for every single patient you assess. Although this is a concluding slide, there are a couple more slides after this, just to reinforce a couple of points made in our article. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
This was a recent editorial in The Times which really captures the sense of frustration that the public have when they see their loved ones attending in crisis and them being received with a rather sort of formulaic tick box approach, which they really find very impersonal and um, and that really feel that, you know, that, that tick box approaches should be ditched and that we should really move towards the kind of approach that we've described in this presentation. Next slide, please. There are challenges, obviously, to the approaches we've described here, and there are implications for for training. And you know, for many, many years, Keith has published, um, you know, for, for Keith has published a systematic re review which shows that for many years there has been qualitative evidence published showing that you know people have very bad experiences of um, A and E and um, presenting in suicidal crisis. And it's very clear that some of the attitudes of staff. Um, are, are very uh, difficult to contend with at times and so there's a lot of training implications there and it's also important that hospital organisations are on board with the approach we describe and don't insist on the tick box approach that is um, so much maligned. There is obviously a lot of paperwork involved in thinking about um, you know documenting the extensive histories that are being gathered and there's also something to think about with coroners if coroners insist that you know tick, tick box approaches should be followed when we're doing these kind of assessments. And finally, you know, in the middle of the night in a very busy A&E department, it may be very difficult to find a quiet place and to find the time to do an assessment such as the one we describe. But I hope that this presentation really reinforces how important this is to, to at least try and do so. Next slide, please. I'm now going to hand over to Steve Gilbert. Um, but just do read our paper because I hope that you'll find it interesting to, to read what we're discussing here in more detail. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank the whole team for for uh, wholeheartedly and for, for fully involving me um, in the process of, of writing this paper. Um, and what I want to do is I want to I want to share a set of experiences. Um, so I want to take you back to June 2008. Uh, and if you were with me then, you'd have been living in a postgraduate house. Um, I had been working as a, a supply teacher, an unqualified teacher teaching science. Um, and I lived a couple of hundred metres away from the GP surgery really nice area that I lived in. And this is now the end of June. And I am terribly depressed and I am convinced that I have to die. And. I knew I had to go to the GP. I knew I had to go and talk to someone. Um, I'd exhausted all other options. I tried to find some online support. I try to find um, what I now know to be kind of third sector support. Uh, I wasn't eligible or the wait lists were extremely long. And the walk from my front door to the GP surgery is still one of the longest walks I ever took. And I remember walking up and there were steps one side and there was a, uh, an accessibility ramp and there were these doors that, that were on a sensor that opened. And the first time I walked, that's as far as I got. And then I ran home and locked the door. And then a few days later, I mustered the strength to, to go back and I kind of got halfway up the ramp and then I went home and and eventually after a few days and a couple of more of attempts I actually managed to make it through the doors. And. I took one look at the receptionist and ran out. I finally managed to make it all the way up the steps. To the receptionist desk. And I can still remember this face. I can still remember having to 
explain why it was so urgent that I needed to see a GP. I want you now to picture that there had been a camera focused on me the whole time and I didn't look like I look now. You were looking at a man who was 24 who hadn't slept properly for eight weeks. You are looking at a man who hadn't eaten properly for eight weeks. A man who every single waking moment was trying to figure out how do I fix my life? I, it was falling apart. And at the same time, I don't want to be here. And that must have been visible. Yeah, I was having to prove that I need to see somebody. After that experience, I was told to go and um, come back for my appointment. And when I got there to go and wait in the waiting room, so I, so I did. That's what I did. Um, I got there early, about 15 minutes early. And I just sat there the whole time crying and nobody came near nobody not nobody else waiting in the waiting room came over and asked if you know if there was something they could do if i was okay none of the staff none of the administrative staff came and asked if i was okay and the reason that i'm sharing this is that it's so important to share some idea of what happens before you even get into the room. And all of what we've been speaking about, and, and you know, I um, could not be more behind, um, you know, the ideas that, that, that my colleagues are talking about, but whether or not we're talking about therapeutic relationships or we're talking about risk assessment, you can't do anything if there is no connection. You can't do anything if there is no trust. And the excuse that comes back to me quite often is, Steve, there's only 10 minutes. It takes 10 seconds to tell someone that you care. It takes 10 seconds to sit there and look that person in the eye and say, I do not know what you are going through, but I can see that it is etched on your face. With the time that we've got, we are going to do what we can to keep you safe right now. And to figure out what we do next. And. I feel like sometimes that gets lost. I think that sometimes. Um, process takes over. Now, from the point of view of somebody who, you know, I've been uh, a patient within um, mental health services since 2008, as someone who has had three very significant periods of suicidal behavior and, and attempts, I absolutely want the best clinical care. I want the person sat opposite me to be using a whole range of tools to try to formulate the best response. Um, it's really helpful if they've got risk factor data, not that they're going to use that to predict what might happen to me, but to kind of go, well, actually, we know there is something currently going on with young men. Um, and that actually we can use some of that intelligence to think about what might be helpful for you. But I absolutely want you to see me as the person stood there in front of you. I saw two different GPs. Um, I saw a GP on that occasion. Um, and before before I'd even really kind of explained what I was experiencing. I was handed a script for an antidepressant. And that's not what I wanted. I wanted someone to to to, to be there and to see my distress. I'm not saying that an antidepressant wasn't part of the answer. It just wasn't the whole answer. And we went back four weeks later and I say we this was my 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 my, my friend. And my friend. Has no medical qualifications. She's the person that kept me alive. 
because she connected with me. And it was only through her that I was able to then get the correct medical care. And even with that, there were still road bumps. We saw the next GP and, and we were told, well, if I'd been serious, I'd have done it by now. And I just think it's so, so important for us to, to see the wider, that wider context and, and to really understand that not that's not everybody's story and, and everybody comes into that 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 assessment that gp's room if it's a e wherever they're coming in differently but something has happened and it it doesn't matter whether or not that person became really unwell about an hour before or if it's taken them a hundred days we have to be really mindful that talking to somebody about the fact that you want to override your body's safety mechanisms and you want to take your own life is by far one of if not the most difficult thing a person may have to do the shame that's felt as part of that the saying it out loud and what does that mean when you're hearing it back and the idea that we know that we might be denied care is hugely important. So that's kind of what I wanted to share um, and, and to really share that in my mind, anything and everything that can really contribute to care, to love is the foundation of Therapeutic Alliance. And that has to be the right way forwards. Thank you so much, Steve, for sharing those thoughts um, and experiences with us. Certainly what I took away from listening to you is, you know, for us to sort of think about everything that's happened before we're sitting alongside somebody who's in such a high level of, um, you know, emotional, psychological distress and who may also be experiencing suicidal thoughts and behaviours. It's really important, isn't it? This hasn't just started today. And I think, um, that's the same for our patients and service users, but also their family members and friends who have been experiencing that um, build up of, of a crisis situation for a long time before we come into the mix. Um, and, so, and the other things, you know, along those lines of family and friends, you talked about the, the connection that you had with your friend and it was your friend who, who got you through that. Um, and the connection is what it the, is fundamental isn't it to a good therapeutic alliance and our connection with people might be different of course to the connection they will have with family members or friends but it is nonetheless a connection and it is that connection that can really um uh be instrumental in in good care and then and, the last and if i may just quickly on that it's a connection not a transaction yeah, and i absolutely. think so much of our healthcare is transactional and, and that's appropriate at certain times this, what's happened, where are you now? And, and I'm really glad somebody said about what's coming up in the future for you. It is a relationship, no matter how, you know, that might only last for a couple of weeks. It might be the start of a, you know, multi-year long relationship. It's not transactional. Yeah, yeah, really important point. Thank you, absolutely. And then the other thing I got from you, uh, well, one of the many things I got from you, but, you know, was, that actually the knowledge is important, isn't it? Whether we choose to call it a risk factor or um, another factor or, or whatever we choose to call it, it is knowledge and knowledge is helpful. Um, and we can use the connection to draw on our knowledge um, to help work with that uh, patient service user and hopefully their family to think about what's important for you, what's, you know, what's going on for you and how can we help you through this really, really difficult time. So, th so the knowledge is, is important. Um, but mustn't be diluted by that transactional approach. So thank you, Steve, that was really helpful. So we've got some time for Q and A's. Um, do um, put some into the box. We've, we've had one, uh, there's, a, there's a thank you for you, Steve, in the questions box, but there's also um, a question, which I think was for you, Keith, when you were talking about um, uh, the, the patient's, um, the research that you were talking about and a question from somebody around are the 
patient populations you were discussing all adults or were they also young people? So I wonder if I could ask you, Keith, to answer that question, but also, of course, share any reflections um, you have from uh, Steve's contribution. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, well, I think the uh, certainly the confidential inquiry data covers um, uh, people of all age, of all ages who've died by suicide. So it would would it would in addition include uh, children and adolescents. And I, I I don't think there's any reason to believe that um, prediction uh, approaches uh, don't work well uh, applies to uh, children and adolescents. In fact, probably more so. Um, because I think the changeability in thinking about uh, suicide and, and, su and the nature of suicidal suicidation is even more fluctuating uh, and often briefer in, in, in children and adolescents. So I think all of this applies um, uh, across the board. And, and of course, I would include um, older people uh, in, in that as well. I mean, I think the... Um, message you know coming across from Steve has really amplified you know as uh, Alexandra discussed and amplified by Karen just now is this importance of human connection I mean yeah I remember people, somebody saying to me in a meeting you know what is the one thing that you think is most important in suicide prevention and I thought for a moment I thought well it is human connection and um, it's just not it's not just being present with humans, it's the nature of that um, psychological and the empathy uh, of that of that um, relationship. And I think some clinicians are particularly good at doing this. They, in a sense, um, are naturals, if you like, in in show feeling empathy, showing empathy, and so on. Uh, for others, I think it, 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 training can be very helpful. Uh, I mean, Karen, you do a lot of training in, in relation to this area. I'm sure you'd agree that one can train, help people develop skills which will enhance that sense of connection and empathy in their interactions with, uh, with patients. Thank you, Keith. Alexandra, did you want to share some reflections um, at all at this point before I move on to some other questions? I think it's really just that, that sense, I use the word kind of golden hour, uh, expression golden hour, because this might be the first time someone's presenting in crisis. And if, you know, if, if we fail to, to really kind of be thoughtful and gain that therapeutic alliance, we could have, you know, quite severe ramification that that might have severe ramifications for them because they may never come back because they've just learned it's completely futile so no matter how tired or overworked we are there's quite a lot of pressure on us to really enact the things we've described here because it's it is such a golden opportunity and if we also shift something for them and they end up thinking oh I, I'd never thought of you know staggering my pain medications like that or you know, something like that, then they feel, God, it really is worth coming back here to get some help. So it's sort of added pressure on us all as clinicians. Yeah, and that leads me to the next question, Alexander, which I'll start with you, if that's OK. Why do you think NH staff might not take the time to care and connect with their patients? And what can be done to address this? Well, I think you can read an article like this and, and listen to what we're saying and agree with everything, really, but still feel very anxious that you might be hauled up by a trust manager or in the coroner's court and asked to account for not having filled in a load of checklists. And you might know that, you know, you saved your, your patient the ordeal of kind of sitting through this wooden questioning and, and, you know, wasting time when you could have been actually asking them about themselves, but you still carry this anxiety because it's, it's, it's something we've operated under for many years. Thank you. And I can see, because I can see people, I can see Steve nodding. Steve, have you got thoughts about that question? Why NH staff, NHS staff might not take the time to care and connect? I, I, don't, I don't think it's not necessarily that they're not caring. I think it kind of goes to the point that, that Keith made that 
I mean, I, you know, I, I think I think there is something around protection against compassion fatigue. I think, you know, when you are, you know, you're dealing with all different forms of distress, people coming in with, you know, poorly children and the, all sorts of things. There's a lot of emotion there full stop. I think actually for me that the, it isn't so much about that the people are in caring. I think it's what is the vehicle for caring? What is the what is the tool that allows you to almost kind of systematically care? Um, because also what I wouldn't want is somebody getting in the boat with me necessarily because that doesn't move it forward. That doesn't help. Um, so I don't. I have met some really uncaring professionals, but by and large, I think it is more. Not having a way in which to care that's that's really helpful um is quite difficult and i think also if you've been a if you've been a clinician or a nurse for any number of years you will have experienced a loss of patients or someone you know to suicide and that must be so incredibly difficult it it, it must be really 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 painful um so i get that you don't want to mess up i get that you you know we're, we're trying something new here um and we're trying and that's why i don't think it's about not doing a risk assessment i think it's about expanding the process um i also think there is something about and again being really careful not to speak for all service users because that would be completely inappropriate say if i go to a GP and I've got a suspected broken toe, I don't expect that GP to fix my broken toe. I expect them to start that process of helping me to fix my toe. Um, and that process of going away with some information that might help in the form of a safety plan is the start of that. Um, I think also there's something about explaining the process of well why are we doing why are we using this risk factor at all if you're if if we start to say actually it's because it might help to throw up something which can help with your plan it's about changing the paradigm there rather than it is widely known that it's used to ration care it's used to say you're high risk you're low risk um we're going to really care about you we're not going to care about you. So I don't, again, I think it's not just about the tool, it's about the way in which we communicate what role they are playing in that moment. Um, and, and that needs some exploration and that needs us all to kind of come together and go, what is it in that 10 minutes that we're trying to achieve? What is it we're trying to um, make sure happens? Thank you, Steve. Of course, in mental health, we hope, you know, hopefully have longer than than 10 minutes, but, it, but the issue is about limited time and there's lots that we, we can do. And on the subject of limited time, I've got a few questions to, um, to get through. There's a couple, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna quickly respond to because they're fairly quick. Um, I mean, we could have a whole webinar on family and friends. We have had one previously, we will do again, but there is a question, could more be done to work with family and friends to allow them to offer more support? And yes, absolutely they can. And just to, um, give you some information. You know, we do have a carer's strategy. Di Hilson is our carer's lead who does um, an awful lot of work around carers. We do have a carer support group that runs once a month that Di and I both co-facilitate that is for family members and carers of people, um, you know, who maybe they think may be uh, at risk of suicide or struggle with um, regular suicidal thoughts and behaviours. There is going to be a Family Connections course commencing in Bucks. Um, family Connections is a 12 week course, um, evidence based course that work, where for, trained facilitators work with families of people, um, predominantly people who have a diagnosis of emotional stable personality disorder, but not solely that population, people who struggle with self harm and suicidal thoughts. And as part of our nursing strategy, we are prioritising families and carers. So watch this space. Um, and I think in the next series of webinars, it would be good to devote a whole session to that very issue. There's a few uh, questions around training. Um, there's quite a lot of work going on in the community about developing uh, training for um, A&Es, uh, uh, non-mental health A&E staff and GP surgeries. There's never enough. Um, you know, an A&E liaison service is, 
also have a responsibility for, for delivering services uh, training, which they do, you know, the site liaison teams. Um, so there is a lot going on at the moment from training, and I'm very happy to, if anyone wants to contact me, to give you some more information. There's also training coming up for receptionists and administrative staff in, um, I think, think December. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but again, email me and I'll let you know. Now, I want to um, bring up a question, Keith and Alexandra, in the last few minutes about pain. So um, someone has put that at Luther Street, um, we have lots of, which is one of our local GP practices um, that works with homeless uh, people and people with substance problems, Alexandra. So we have lots of patients who end up dying from overdoses, some accidental, some perhaps deliberate. As a result, they're in our very strict guidelines, which prevent prescription of um, gabapentinoids uh, and opiates. This results in some people who are in severe pain being denied effective analgesia. Your suggestion of treating pain to address causes is good, but in practice, how to balance this against the risk of giving potentially dangerous addictive medications, which may increase risk of successful or you know, a, a dangerous overdose? Any thoughts, Alexandra? Yeah, I mean, I used to work as an oncology liaison psychiatrist and, and we often had situations where patients had a lot of medications but were acutely suicidal. And so we used to speak to the, the cancer clinicians about considering transdermal administration of pain medications because you know that they're safer than than oral preparations. Um, and so I think, you know, what I often do in, in clinical practice, I work in a veterans service where a lot of the patients have got um, pain is really refer them to a pain clinic where they can discuss safer options and and think about having access to a whole range of pain relief because if you only have you know one medication available to you you can't really sort of work out the regime that works for you so i think you know to to know that um that you've had the full range of options explained to you including things like um steroid injections and other approaches that that are safe um is really important so i i think we need to use make better use of, of pain clinics actually. Thank you. We do have three minutes. Um, so Keith, I've got one for you. This is one close to my heart and it, the, it says, I'm curious if women of a certain age have been specifically looked at in terms of suicidality and menopause. Yeah, a very interesting and important question. Um, and I think um, overall um, there hasn't been enough attention to uh, how suicidal, you know, suicide uh, risk, if you like, um, uh, self-harm and so on, varies at different times uh, during women's lives, um, particularly times of change and particularly times of hormonal change, which may, uh, for example, increase um, risk of depression and uh, uh, and, and have social effects which may add to uh, uh, people's dis distress um, and indeed risk. Um, so there is a certain amount of work and um, uh, Alexandra you're probably familiar with this as well, but there is some evidence of uh, increases in levels of suicide around uh, the menopause but um, I think the important thing is here, you know, what, in what particular groups is, the, is this the case? Uh, and indeed, of course, you know, what can be done to, to mitigate that, uh, that, that risk? And indeed, acknowledging that people may, you know, have increased levels of depression at these times is an important factor and making sure clinicians are aware of it. And again, that they can empathise uh, with it, um, with the difficulties that women may have at these uh, uh, stages is, is um, extremely important. Thank you, Keith. Um, now we have lots more questions and we haven't got time to answer them all, but do you know what I'm thinking um, is that some of the questions are around you know, really, how, how do we balance a caring approach with individuals who present at a and &E multiple times? Because it can feel like reinforcement of unhelpful contacting of emergency services. Uh, services. Um, how can you approach a patient that you're concerned about if they said they're not suicidal? So it's striking me that perhaps, um, you know, in our next series of webinars, we need to devote one to these particular questions so we can have, you know, perhaps a whole webinar around some of the dilemmas in practice. 
we know what we need to do. How can we how can we how can we manage it given um, some of the obstacles, barriers and challenges that um, that we face in clinical practice? So thank you very much for those questions. Please keep them coming because they will inform um, future webinars. So in our last few seconds, I'd like to say thank you very much to Steve, Keith and Alexandra, also to Victoria, uh, Catriana and Emily from comms, without whom these webinars wouldn't happen. Thank you all to you for, um, you know, for joining and for giving loads of um, really interesting uh, questions and food for thought. And uh, we will see you in two weeks time for our next webinar, which is has a focus on men's mental health. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye.